everybody and i hope you're having a good day or you are looking forward to a good day i uh looking forward to a good stream <laughs> hopefully we don't have everything blowing up on me it isn't uh, too common but also it's still sort of a baby on the streaming scene so we'll see how we go So if you're um, new to the Twitch game yourself, uh, feel free to add comments whenever you'd like to ask questions in the stream. I will have that open as well, and we can uh, we can we can answer them as we go through. But feel free to interrupt me at any stage, and we uh, we can rock on. So let's let's start with a trait. Sorry, let's start with a type. Uh, this kind of conf oh, this was used to the last yesterday's one. So let's kind of start with um, creating our main function and creating a container of something just so we can double check everyone's on the same page. Uh, forest the vector of what? We will just kind of create a struct tree. Maybe we could give it a species name, perhaps. But uh, right now, start with something pretty simple. And. Let's just see if this will work. So we've got tree here to say or tree and forest. Now the vector will know exactly how to enable something to iterate through it. If it didn't, um, life would be a bit challenging for beginner Rust programmers. And I'm going to implement a derived tree. I'm going to enable this tree to be printed on screen by deriving debug. Right. See, that works. In line three, we don't need a semicolon, which is fine. Away. Aha! Okay, we got one tree. You know, pretty basic. And we may as well just create a real forest because right now we have a bit of a sad one. Now I've got five of these things. Oop. Oh, except we've got another syntax error, so I'm just going to click on tools here and format the code just so that it can sharpen me up. And where's my close delimiter? Okay, one, two, three, four. Okay, useful. Okay, so I've got a forest of four trees. Uh, <laughs> pick your species that you'd prefer. Now, let's say though that for whatever reason my comp my program becomes more complicated and I actually want a forest in there that actually itself contains a vector of trees. Now what do I do if I want to iterate through the forest? I can't. So uh, let's just produce this with the literal syntax. almost exactly the same in some sense. We've got a forest thing here and our trees. We can still use the VEC macro. If you've never encountered Rust before, some of my functions, in fact, every one that you've seen so far has uh, this exclamation mark at the, at the end of it. Don't worry about that. <laughs> you, uh, uh, it's, this is a, a macro invocation in Rust. If you've never used a macro, it's kind of like a function, uh, and by the time that you learn enough, 
that you don't like you understand why it's not a function you would have understand what you would have understood uh what macros are so uh, for now i now just think of them as functions okay right okay so this is difficult um so this is actually where the problem that we wanted to encounter uh, we've got our forest type and uh, let's say the reason why we needed a forest type is because we want latitude and we got lat longs in there or something um <laughs> like, which is also ridiculous because why on earth would you uh, need a bounding box uh like, or like some kind of like actual geo geospatial type but we'll just um, ignore that for now. What we care about is this forest thing. We need to be able to turn our struct or give our struct, we kind of need to bless it with this um, syntax. I mean, it's possible that we, we, we could avoid it for now if it was at a pinch, we could say, you know, we could have our good old let, uh, a let keyword introduces a variable and all variables are immutable by default in Rust and we could create an integer there and then it's while i is less than forest breeze len print uh, so we could kind of muck around like this and say tree is forest trees. Hi. But, and then print that out. And if you're starting out and this feels more natural to you, because you might have come from see or uh, pick your flavor of programming language and this kind of makes a little bit more sense to you don't feel obligated to opt into complexity or unnecessarily so this will probably work <coughs> oh. oh actually it doesn't because of move semantics so i will oh, there's one other thing that i need to do which is to increment i we've got a few errors here so we'll increment i by one the other thing is we have this um so that's that fixes that first compiler bug so we'll fix that and uh we've got this other one move occurs here consider borrowing what on earth does that mean <laughs> well what it means is uh we are I don't want to explain the whole concept of borrowing and ownership right now, but if we can ask for a read only reference to a value, and that's what it's recommended we do here because we don't need to modify anything. Rust allows you to have multiple, uh, to take read only accesses to values without needing to necessarily, uh, with, with, with kind of, just a little bit of ceremony. We've got this this ampersand, which is uh, which is the reference operator, uh, which is inherited from like most C languages. Anyway, this is actually the garbage we want to avoid. I should kind of get to the actual topic. I'm trying to just kind of provide some motivation about why uh, this iterator thing is useful. Now we can uh, let me go back. I started the uh, start of the stream actually chatting about the fact that we have a trait called into iterator and one benefit of implementing into iterator is that your type will work with the Rust's for loop syntax so that's the motivation now there's this example which talks about whether when you use a wrapper type we can effectively delegate to that wrapper type by implementing 
one method. And effectively, all we do is we delegate from our into iter method delegates to our one. Let's copy that pattern in our code. So let's copy and paste from this from the documentation we are implementing into iterator. First, we'll bring one other kind of not really gotcha, but something that's useful for Rust coders to know is that when you define or when you implement an interface, right? when you implement a trait for a type, you need to bring that type into local scope that avoids things like name clashes. Feel free, by the way. Um, welcome to anyone that's new. Hi, it's nice to see you. Uh, you are more than welcome. More than welcome to ask questions at any stage whatsoever. The advantage of being live is that I'm actually able to do that to respond to those questions for you, and I thoroughly recommend that you take me up on that um, because you'll probably reveal a whole lot of ignorance. But uh, ignore that. <laughs> um, now. I, uh, if you're new to Rust, this types thing, this is all a bit kind of weird. So I'm just going to put the right, or what I hope are the right values in here, and backfill you with the knowledge. Hopefully you can probably gain an intuition, uh, maybe yourself. Uh, it took me a long, long time. I don't even, uh, it took me a long time to, to, to convince myself that I knew what I was talking about. We actually don't have a tree <laughs> field, we have a trees field. Tree, 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 yay! Ha ah, awesome. And what the hell just happened? Okay, let's, let's, let's back up. First of all, uh, inside a trait, you're entitled to uh, create effectively type variables that are referenced inside the rest of the uh, trait. So what we've done here is, or the person who has created this trait inside the standard library, so the, the, the authors of Rust decided that what we need is two things. Uh, our item is the item that will be yielded by the iterator. And so, uh, in our case, it's this tree thing. Now, uh, now this type into iterator is a kind of a very, very strange thing to think about. But it is an iterator that understands the into method. Uh, uh, whenever you see into at the start of a trait, it refers to. Let me pull up some other documentation. It, it actually has a bit of a technical meaning in Rustland, and there's another trait that uh, you come to come and love, or come and you kind of hate, or do something with, and that's um, into. So whenever you see into on around a trait, you kind of know it probably has something to relate to that, and it's all about type conversions. So what we're saying is that. Uh, our iterator, sorry, into iterator will be able to return something that can turn itself into an iterator that itself returns the item or type which we've defined previously. So, where this capital self here is the type variable of the type that we're talking about, which happens to be forest. And forest double colon double colon is item and that's what that syntax all means. So oh, we can take an exhale and we are kind of done. Let's, uh, so, but, but actually I think, uh, so I'm just going to pause there just for a sec and just to kind of again ask if anyone has any questions or would like to uh, follow up. I'm more than happy to answer them now. Uh, that's almost it for the basics. There are a few things that I'd like to reiterate. The three methods that are really important for iteration are iter, iter mute, and into iter. We have been using this last one today 
Now, if you are new to Rust, the syntax ampersand t, ampersand mut t, and just big capital T doesn't necessarily mean too much. So allow me to double check or reinforce understanding. Iter iterates over a reference to t, or a given type. That means a read-only, oh sorry, yeah, a read-only access to t. That would potentially enable you to go uh, use it again and again and again. Because uh, what you're telling Rust is he promised not to touch anything inside. Now, intermute enables you to have read-write access through t. So your iterator can, uh, your iterator can actually mutate values. And into iter, right, into iter, you might think, I've, I've got read-only and I've got read-write, like what's the third version? The third version denotes borrowing and ownership. So these two have the ampersand syntax. They are borrows of values. The third one is taking ownership over the value. Now, in Rust, an owner's job is to, to destroy the value when it goes out of scope. Now, and uh, that's one of the reasons why when you're trying code out, you would, that's one of the reasons when you try and code out, sometimes you're like typing iter, sometimes you're putting a reference at the front of it or typing into iter. It can be really, really frustrating to get an intuition about those three types and how they interact. Um, the into iter method, uh, sorry, trait is <clears throat> uh, an iterator that works only once. Uh, if we were to do that twice, it's just, it would recreate another iterator Oh, sorry, I say it. The Rust compiler would create another another iterator twice. Let's try and confirm that. Oh, oh it's still saying that we, quite rightly. Uh, so what it tried to do there, by the way, just in, um, because this syntax, uh, this inter iterator takes ownership. Or we actually destroy the forest when it reaches lane 28 because uh, that's the job of an owner. So let's try and see what happens when we put an ampersand at the front, like it's recommending. So it's saying, value moved here, consider borrowing to avoid moving into the for loop. Ampersand forest. So that's quite useful. So let's try, let's see, try, try that. Oh. And now it's complaining quite angrily that it's not able to comply with that. So if you, like, you know, go back to this page about the three forms of iteration, the first one, sorry, the first one is this ampersand type, which we've just asked to do. We didn't implement that first type version. We implemented over this last version. And so, if you want to know more about implementing the iterator type, I would recommend that you check out actually the video from yesterday. Uh, I can, I'll, if anyone's interested, I'm more than happy to, um, actually I'll pump a link in there or even, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just kind of scurry around and try and find that. So it's actually up on YouTube and that was quite a fun stream. So if you go to the YouTube channel that I'm just about to put in the chat, you'll find a playlist which is about learning Rust. <clears throat> so go in there and, and you'll find a tutorial very similar to this one talking about the iterator trait. Iterator trait. Uh, into iterator and iterator interact. So whenever something is implemented 
the trait that enables this first one also by definition implements this one there's actually a uh there's there's, there's kind of this trick inside the rust compiler that it knows how to it's with generic types that it's been able to do so with that i again oh, i've just had some more people join so i'm really excited so i'm just going to mark that as done and i think we've gone to some bonus content <laughs> How do people feel about that? Uh, one of the things that I think is really cool about Rust is that it's open source. And that means we can dig into the implementation of these traits inside, ty inside types ourselves. So this is kind of bonus content for people. If you are ever confused about what a type means, let's say we go to this fused iterator trait and we're like we we kind of we encounter a bunch of text here an iterator that always con continues to yield none when exhausted so instead of <coughs> by calling next on a fused iterator that is return none once it's guaranteed to always return none uh, actually that's not super interesting because all iterators should behave in that way. Uh, let me find something that is maybe a double-ended iterator. Sounds like something as difficult to implement. So we we get this thing about what we need to implement uh, provide uh, required methods. So Rust will typically have very a good trait will have very few required methods because but several provided provided methods it can do that because of its generics capability so it actually has auto implementations of all of these other um these other methods with inside the uh double ended iterator but what we really are interested in is the stuff right down the bottom the stuff right down the bottom is every implementation of this trait so a thing that you've probably seen a lot, let's say, is like dealing with bytes. Actually, yeah. And kind of a warning, <laughs> perhaps. Uh, this isn't prepped, so uh, I'm hopeful that this works. But what we get is a, uh, we've got this bytes type <clears throat> and this kind of weird wink <laughs> syntax is saying that it's a lifetime parameter. Oh, sorry, it, that, that any lifetime will will be fine. And, and in fact, it doesn't really care about the the, the lifetime. Uh, so this kind of doesn't seem to make a lot of sense because we're referring to self dot zero next back nth back. We're just delegating to these internal some internal collection so I need to find the so that's the um oh, what I really want is the struct let's see if we can find it uh, just by using uh, control F which is probably oh here we go so we're pretty close now I think bytes is not empty that's not what I want uh, the reason why I really want to do this is I want to get to what happens under the hood. So often these wrappers will just delegate to internals, uh, some internal collection, and I would not worry at all about doing the same for your types. Uh, if you, and I'm going to try and find something that's, it's maybe lines will be a little bit friendlier. And what I'm trying to find is the actual thing that we are holding uh well that's actually doing the double ended iteration so it's going into the source code of the uh so again all we do is this lines type is a wrapper around some internal collection and it uh it just delegates 
Oh, and you can see actually the implementation of iterator itself is like super simple. It just delegates as well. Now, doo -doo 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 -doo. the problem with this standard library is that it's quite large. If I just search for struct. Lines. Not even in here, so that's useful. I could look in GitHub. Is anyone keen for us to kind of continue to dig? <laughs> Funny if there's a whole bunch of robots in my in my uh, uh, just just kind of lurking in my stream because they needed to be pretend that they were actual humans. That would be fun. Fun for me. We're great for my stats. Okay, so now we need to go to the type. So I'm just going to actually use the actual search functionality uh, inside the docs. And digging in, I'm digging in. Ugh. Ah, okay. Okay, so that's almost useful. Pub struct lines lifetime of A is actually, this is the internal collection. As a map. Like, okay, that's not what I expected. So, <laughs> basically, so it's uh, okay. So we're going to have to dig in here. I bet that, that if I go to map, it will also delegate. And I started to think, this is ridiculous. Uh, like, how do you? How? Do, how what? And the reason why this works is Rust aggressively uh, aggressively inlines. Sorry, and uh, we can continue to when I'm constructing a an abstract, sorry, a concrete type or some sort of user friendly type at the end. I can uh, embed other types as as much as I want, and it's not going to incur any runtime cost. <laughs> I love it. Okay, and it's even got this note about the map iterator implements double entered iterator, meaning that you can also map backwards. That's nice because um, <laughs> the segue through the standard library is all about double entered iteration. I'm super stoked. Okay, so what is a struct? What is the what is the map? This is it. It is it takes an iterator. And, a, and an if, which one assumes is a function, which might make sense because uh, if we go back to the uh, place where we were, which was the uh, lines struct, which is kind of an internal struct that is used by the by a the lines method. Oh, I've gone too far. <clears throat> oh, I'll search map. How about I search for lines? Then, uh... oh, <laughs> I love it. Not bots. Awesome. <laughs> Sorry if I took a few minutes to get back to you. Uh... And yes, humans. All right. All right. Okay. Awesome. I. I'm more than happy to keep digging. I, I'm enjoying this actually. I have very weird pastimes, and uh, turns out Rust is one of them. So that's great. So let's go open up line. I think we were actually in the wrong type. I think yeah. we're kind of lost in the woods a bit, uh, or in the forest as maybe. Well, oh, actually, this is this is exactly what we were. So first we have this map thing, and it, it uh, if we look at map, we know that it takes iterator and a function so we've got to parse this map this is the iterator oh sorry that is the function which doesn't look like a function uh, but i'm sure it is well i say that the split terminator thing is uh, is the iterator so one assumes that it takes characters and or a character and then we'll split a string into multiple 
<clears throat> into multiple lines, right? Now I haven't seen lines in any map before, so let's see if we can find that thing. Uh, poking around inside the internals is actually really fun, and the standard library is very well written, and the it's also quite accessible. So it's actually a very very easy way to find well written Rust code. Now we're at a problem, a bit of a crossroads here. Lines any map doesn't exist within inside the standard library surface level kind of documentation. It's very private. Um, well, wait, there's more. We can't GitHub. So let's go to GitHub and pull up the Rustlang source. Uh, actually, that's... <clears throat> okay. Okay, now I'm going to have a look for it here. There it is. <laughs> okay, it's inside. Oh, it's actually, it should be very close. Oh no, it's down here in line 15, 116. Mod RS, which is actually where we were. So we were just a couple of dozen lines away. 1516, it should be right here, and there it is. So, <clears throat> like I said, we thought it was a function, or at least that's what it was supposed that, that's what we, we expected it should be. Uh, and if you look at its function, like it's it's a struct, but actually it's a struct masquerading as a function. If you happen to know anything about um, closures in Rust, you might know. So it's got it's a function with the type signature that it takes a string and returns a string. This is kind of the dark arts of, of Rust, but hey, whatever. Uh, what we're doing is we're taking the line and then we're kind of doing some analysis to check whether we are at the end of a line. And we're making a decision about what we should return, which is either going to be uh, a line minus the terminal string. Like, sorry, the, 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 so basically, either we're clipping one character off the end of the of the of the line, which is right here, or we're just kind of kind of returning the whole thing back to them. So <clears throat> now, what what on earth? Why why would you do that? Okay, so. Well, you might want to do that because you need a lot of control. Uh, it, this is kind of the guts. This is inside libcore. This isn't actually in part of the standard library. If you go look at the URL, you can see that we're in source core stir mod rs. So this is kind of the very, very guts of Rust. So you probably don't have all the tools of Rust like in the core, that's my guess. I'm actually not a core developer. So uh, what they've been able to do is use the struct definition to masquerade as a function. Uh, what I was saying about, if you know anything about closures, you'll know that they're actually implement, they actually are implemented as a top or not, uh, not autonomous or anonymous structs. They enclose values by copying them into a struct which they then which are then accessed as local variables inside the function um, check out my book if you want to know about stack frames um, oh there's a hello I, I should wait back hey cat peasant that's an odd name i mean that in a nice way <laughs> I've also got a, a nice, I've got a weird name. Uh, the uh, little letter. Okay, so uh, if you're relatively new to the stream, I uh, just kind of want to shout out that we have kind of gone well, well beyond implementing Iterator or into Iterator. We've kind of gone and looked through it. We've had a bit of a tour of, uh, or a bit of a guided session about 
finding an arbitrary trait and saying, well, if I can't really understand the documentation for it, so like this thing into, like, I don't really get it. Like you look through the docs and you're like, and it sucks. I just don't, I can't figure it out. Like what, what we ended up doing was scrolling right to the bottom. <laughs> and this is a complete anom an anomaly, but we'll go we'll pretend as if it's not. So we went to the very bottom of the trait that we were interested in, and in that case it was double ended iterator, but in this case it's into. And we clicked on one of the types that was implementing it, and then we dug into the source code. And so we found ourselves inside libcore looking at how uh, byte slice the byte slices which are you know, a u8 slice uh, implement like a uh, a splitting method which kind of was not where I intended to go at all but it's actually been a very nice um, kind of it's been a, a very nice uh, kind of tour through rust but um, here's another thing that we may as well explain while we've still got an audience I mean hey it feels like uh, feels like something you do when you have an audience. You kind of um, tell them stuff. So, what on earth does this syntax mean? I'm going to mark this because it also feels like a useful kind of point. Um, Forty six minutes in, we're chomping it a bit. <laughs> um, my uh, family think I'm very strange. I'm very uncool dad. Um, getting onto the, the streaming bandwagon, but I enjoy it. Or at least I've been a streamer for like, what, a week? <laughs> okay, so let's go back to talking about what on earth it is that uh, this means. We've got impl t, comma, u, close bracket, into u for t, where u from t. Mm. It feels a lot like a computer is talking to a computer there, doesn't it? Like, it doesn't exactly strike me as something that's intended for people. Uh, let me explain what it's doing and then we'll go back and explain what it means. Uh, first of all, implementing, uh, what it's trying to do is for every type that it implements from, implements into. That's, that's the crux of it. It's using generic types to do all of the implementation for us. Now, that means that, uh, and so what, what, what on earth is all this junk? Well, T is the type that you're talking about. Into, oh sorry, U is the type that you're going to turn into. We only, and U follows T in the alphabet. So it's the next best thing to T. And what it's saying is that into is implemented for every type T where U implements the from type. So when, if I want to turn into, say like I'm a, a float uh, 30, no, let's say I'm a float 32, and I want to, which is, happens to be a very bad example uh, for multiple reasons, but she was going to go for unsigned 32. And I want to turn myself into an unsigned... Uh, actually, that's also a bad example. Oh, goodness me. Uh, let's say I'm a float 32, and I want to turn myself into a float 30, uh, 64. That would, only be, that would be automatically implemented if I was if float 64 had a from method. or like, a, And so we can dig into that. Uh, and I'll go and see if I'm proven right about whether or not float64 and 32 can, uh, can be converted from one another, one another. Now, normally, it's my understanding is that it's actually safe to convert yourself from 32 bits to 64. But that, for floats, might not be accurate because you could still have a loss of precision, I believe, on... Um, uh, potentially not. Oh, I'm now got a big red light saying that I might be dropping packets. 
Oh, and I've definitely dropped a few viewers, so. <laughs> oh, oh well. Anyway, we are persevering. I will. Uh, let's do that again. So, that story of. Here's binary heap. Now, binary heap implements from where the T is ordered. But how does it do so? I would really like the Rust language itself or the standard library to inform me, the new Rust programmer, how to write good Rust code. And so what we do is we go down to the traits that it implements. In fact, it's probably faster if I go down on the menu on the left. And it implements from vec t. So from any <coughs> t, and we've got this trait or trait bound, which is ord, which means that it can actually be converted from any vector that uh, has elements inside it that are comparable. And bang, there we go. Uh, actually, so the implementation of this is super trivial. It, uh, it just throws it in as it's, the vector just becomes the internal data structure for binary heap. And then we call rebuild. Apparently there's a rebuild method that just takes whatever it's got and uh, and reorders it. So that's great. That's super simple. And <laughs> uh, yeah. Hey, I think I am going to wrap up. Uh, it's been a really lovely stream. I've really enjoyed talking people through iteration and uh, getting the most out of the standard library. I hope you've enjoyed um, hanging out. Uh, feel free to... Uh, uh, to catch me online and uh, with that I think I am gonna sign out at least of the chat which uh